Welcome, welcome everyone to Amos, our course on Agile Methods and open source software. In the previous uh, sessions, we discussed the role of a product owner and we discussed the role of a software developer. The role of a software developer was split along development and quality assurance, a bit artificial, but nevertheless to different sets of activities. And now we will look at process improvement, which mostly correlates with the work of the Scrum Master in an Agile Methods or in a Scrum team. So process improvement in Scrum and beyond mostly is about uh, improving your process by switching between reflecting on it and turning those reflections and what you learned into action. So let's first look at process improvement in general and then the different inflection or reflection points in time where you try to learn about your process and make decisions on how to proceed. So process improvement. So process, process improvement is uh, obviously a practice of improving your processes, your software development processes for various uh, parameters or goals in general to improve performance of your team. Uh, ideally, it is uh, a continuously running process, which doesn't mean you do it all the time, rather more likely you will switch between doing and reflecting where the conclusions on how to improve your process are done during reflection. But uh, for continuous process improvement, you need to have those defined points in time when you reflect. So the main tool to do that is exactly to make room for those points in time where you can reflect. Those are called retrospectives. There are different forms of retrospectives, as we will see. Um, the original retrospectives were only held after a project and often only after a failed project, which is also why their traditional norm, name is post-mortem, after death. That's not the intent. You don't need a failing project uh, to improve your processes. Rather, it is a sign of a well-working software development process that you continuously improve your processes. Retrospectives were really brought to the front uh, of thinking in effective software development by one particular person, person a Norm Kurth who wrote the book uh, on retrospectives. Before you even get started, you need to set the mind right of people because retrospectives easily might lead to blaming. These points of reflection will necessarily look at difficult situations. And since difficult situation often means that something didn't quite work as expected, you are likely or people are likely to blame someone else for things that didn't work. So to stall or to stop this from derailing the process, we have Norm Kurth's prime directive of retro retrospectives. That, retro that directive, uh, which you need to take to heart, reads Regardless of whatever we discover, we must understand and truly believe that everyone did the best job he or she could, given what was known at the time, his or her skills and abilities, the resources available at the situation at hand. I like to shorten it using uh, ever faithful Wikipedia for this. Assume good faith. Do not assume other people are lazy or poor or stupid. Assume good faith of whoever participated. Rarely ever do people participate to wreak havoc 
they're usually working hard to make things work out so that everyone has a good experience. So reducing our norm curves prime directive can be cast as assume good faith and the others do not make assumptions to the contrary. There are some other principles that uh, might apply. So for example, you may uh, want to make it confidential who said what in a retrospective, but still allow for people to take the knowledge out of the meeting. That would be the Chatham house rules where people are free to share, people are free to use this information. So the one sharing information needs to be aware that it will be used but where the rules require that you do not disclose who said or who provided what information. You can also make it much more restrictive. So here the tongue-in-cheek Las Vegas, Las Vegas rule, whatever happens in a retrospective stays in a retrospective, uh, but this really at best applies to the worst of all situations because you want to learn and you want to take things forward and improve processes. So as a consequence, the Las Vegas rule, you might only apply selectively to personal disclosures. Uh, someone has a, a breakdown or gets very emotional, then this should stay within in the retrospective and not leave the room. The overall structure of retrospectives as uh, originally defined by Norm Kurth is pretty straightforward. You have a beginning, you have a middle part, and you have an end. But they have different purposes. So the beginning is really uh, to set things up, um, clarify a little bit, or clear the air in the sense of creating safety. People may have all kinds of misconceptions or they may come from the office still enraged about something else. You need to allow people to cool down, settle in, feel comfortable and create or provide a feeling of safety in which open and honest sharing of memories of what happened is possible. The middle part is then where the work happens uh, in terms of process improvement. This is where using various practices that we will review, you uh, discuss uh, the time frame under discussion, meaning the retrospective usually looks back at a certain time frame, a project or a sprint, some time box, and reviews what happens, discusses it, draws some conclusions. At the end of the retrospective, um, you will try to turn the results of the hard work of the middle part into resolutions. What are we going to do now? So you may already have your conclusions, but you need to resolve to put, put them into action. So there's a separate step from understanding what needs to be done to actually resolving to do it and then later do it. From the Amos project, you already know sprint retrospectives. Uh, you perform them every week at the end of each sprint. But really, retrospectives work on different levels of scale or different uh, time scopes, if you will. Uh, there needs to be some close time period, naturally, to which you relate. Could be very small. Um, could even be a day, but uh, here in Amos or in general, people usually have retrospectives on a sprint. Arguably, uh, the stand-ups, uh, the daily stand-ups contain some retrospective, but uh, it's only sharing, it's not discussion and resolution. So uh, the smallest time frame we look at here are sprints. So there are sprint retrospectives. We also look at product or project release retrospectives. So after a major release that is put into production is cut, you should have a retrospective. So that goes beyond the sprint retrospective. Remember for sprints, we hope for a release, but we don't require it. It's acceptable, it's okay if a sprint release doesn't work out. That would or should not be the case for a project or product uh, release. And hence, the retrospective on the stressful work of 
releasing a project or product is uh, different, is more high stakes than a much smaller sprint retrospective. And finally, there are project retrospectives where if you had a long running project or just a project that officially came to an end, so there is a mission that you hopefully achieved and things are over now and people are about to part ways, maybe to work together in a new project, but uh, that is not a precondition. So if you have that and work ended for a project, then you should have a project retrospective. That is still different from a release from a release retrospective because after a product or project release, you know you will keep going on and release another project or product version. The project retrospective is really after a project ended. The project retrospectives are the classic traditional retrospectives that Norm Kurth facilitated as a process improvement coach. So you can see it illustrated here. These are different time scopes. You have uh, the sprint and the sprints have the retrospective and the closing 3R review, re review, release and retrospective of uh, an Amos or one week sprints. And then you do a couple of those because you're iterating, you're um, going over through this process many times in sequence. Um, in Amos, you also have release retrospect. So you have releases and consequently you can have release retrospectives. You're really only asking for one at the end. Um, and so you do have these two um, release retrospectives of after six, seven uh, weeks. If you were to do it in Amos, so we don't do it in Amos, but if you were to do it in Amos, that's where you would have after a project or product release, uh, your matching retrospective. I encourage you to do it, but again, we don't require it. What we do require is that at the end of the project, uh, there's a project retrospective. So that's the final third step here, where there is uh, uh, one more retrospective of the scope for the whole project. You know you're parting ways. You will not keep working together. You might run into each other. So students might run into each other again during their studies, but uh, it's not a given and it's uh, very different from the continued work within the project. You can see here the three time horizons, the time scope, scopes of sprint release and project, and project, and who participates or who is supposed to participate. For the sprint retrospective, you have as the facilitator, the scrum master of the team, you have the committed people from Scrum's perspective, and that's it. So no need to have the sponsor or business owner uh, participate. This is purely for the team. For a release retrospective, which is typically also managed or facilitated by the Scrum Master, you do have the committed people again, but also in addition the involved people because they are getting the release now. So the project or product release is a release that should be put into a production for sure. And therefore the involved people are affected, the customers, for example. The sponsor would be the business owner in case there is the need for financial means to support the retrospective. Maybe it's an offsite or to give the overall permission, given that it might take time um, while a sprint retrospective is, can just be five to ten minutes in Amos or an hour in a larger scrum team at work a project release or a project a product release retrospective could take hours potentially and longer so it's actually a time investment and there are also financial investment so your business owner uh, might have to sign off on it Finally, uh, the original retrospectives, the postmortem, whether the project died or not, the project retrospectives are probably best done using an external facilitator uh, rather than the team's scrum master. 
you need again the committed and involved people and obviously in particular if you have to pay an external facilitator you'll need the business owner on board as the sponsor of the retrospective. So first let's look at sprint retrospectives as the smallest, uh, most frequent, perhaps easiest form of retrospective. So by definition, a sprint retrospective is a sprint size iteration. Uh, its scope is the most recent sprint that you end with this retrospective. Um, in Amos, it's usually five minutes, 10 minutes, usually uh, probably less, an hour or two maybe in an in a industry team. It does assume that you have learned to work with each other. If you're new, then it will take longer. Um, but the assumption here is that you have so much shared background by the time you regularly, regularly keep doing the retrospective uh, that it will be effective. You don't have to start with Adam and Eve. You already know your problems. You know which problems you resolved and which problems keep recurring. You need the uh, facilitator, that would be the scrum master, and the participants, the committed team members. So the facilitator is a person who obviously manages this process, which can be difficult. As you know, uh, this is how a sprint retrospective in Amos looks like or in Scrum looks like. Um, you close the old sprint with a report. That's just a report on the resolution of impediments from the last uh, sprint retrospective, so to just give people an update. But then either the same Scrum Master or the new Scrum Master performs a roll call uh, on the sprint. And the question they ask are, is always, are always the same. What happened? What went well? What went wrong? And this is the question that this Scrum Master asks and that every committed or that every participant, here only the committed team members, responds to or answers to. In Amos, so uh, you can then, a Scrum Master can then um, discuss with you and facilitate the discussion of possible solutions to these problems called impediments. And you collect the possible solution, you uh, decide on which uh, you want to take on, and so forth. Um, we don't do that in Amos. Uh, we leave it to the Scrum Master to facilitate to finding solutions and facilitating solutions uh, outside of the team meeting. Uh, so rather than making it a, a complex team-based discussion. In the end, uh, teams always want to discuss things that hinder their effectiveness. So it's not that if a Scrum Master writes it down and then comes back to the team that the team will just accept being presented a solution. It will naturally want to be engaged in finding it. So in that uh, roll call, um, the uh, components again are what happened, what went well, what went wrong. And that's what the team members say. And the Scrum Master takes note of that. Um, the, no, the Scrum Master takes note of that. So finding solutions is uh, again delegated to the Scrum Master, though in, uh, if you have more time in industry, it might indeed be the team wish or under the guidance of the Scrum Master. Uh, there may be, in particular when you're just starting out, a lot of impediments. So a Scrum Master needs some prioritization. So they need to prioritize what's more important to address those high value, high risk impediments first, high value, low risk impediments second, and so forth. It's a similar logic as in the features to be implemented. At the end of, uh, of a sprint, uh, the Scrum Master also reports on what they achieved in terms of turning the uh, problem solutions into action, uh, but 
often than the team will already know. So sprint retrospectives happen one after another and you kind of get the hang of it and it's all fine. But sometimes there are deeper or more fundamental problems and those usually need a bit more time of discussion and resolution. So they are often uh, postponed to be discussed in a, in a release retrospective, meaning you were able to release a major new version after six weeks or a quarter and uh, now you want to take a step back uh, and look at it more deeply with more time than the few minutes that you usually only have in a sprint retrospective. So a release retrospective is a retrospective for a project or product release. Um, if you have the duration, the length is commensurate with the duration of the product release. So if you have a quarter of work uh, for had a quarter of uh, quarter of the year time uh, to perform the work, then a day for the release retrospective may may appear proper. If you only do it say every six weeks, then maybe half a day is more appropriate. Similar to a sprint retrospective, the Scrum Master would be a good facilitator and the committed, as well as the involved team members should be the participants. So again here, so the committed team members are obvious, the involved team members are the customers who have to cope with the uh, newly released software now. And this for the first time is a retrospective where you actually have more time. So uh, in particular, because now you have irregular participants, arguably with the, with the involved but not committed uh, members of the team. Uh, so they are not regularly participating. So things may not be as smooth and uh, worn in as with the uh, product owner and software developers, uh, the committed uh, team members. So you need to take that time to create a safe setup, to create a setup where people feel, feel safe and fine uh, to share how they feel and what they learned and what they suggest can be done better. Um, in a release retrospective, you can apply some practices. We will look at some to get to the key issues. You don't just do a roll call where you rely on people's intelligence and observational skills. You actually use some techniques to get the information from participants. For the full project retrospective or postmortem, there will be even more techniques, all derived from Norm Kurth's book. Here, so at least in Amos, for a release retrospective, we simply use the uh, timeline. Um, which is again what happened when, when, when well, and what happened well, what happened was wrong, and you deal with that. But you make it more explicit than just just uh, talking about it. So let's look. Let's look. Uh, but then just just making a roll call on it. So let's look at, at these practices one after another. So creating sa safety is actually not easy. Um, you need a strong scrum master who is capable of facilitating necessarily heavy-handedly, but hopefully not, uh, the actual process. Um, they ideally want to let the process run smoothly by itself, but they need to step in if th things go off, off rail, obviously. So the first best practice here, the first set of practice is to repeat, reiterate, even if people know it, know them, the ground rules of communication. Most notably, it's Norm, it's Kurth, Norm Kurth's prime directive, which I abbreviate again as assume good faith. Uh, it's also to remind people that they should speak to the issues and not attack or address people in, in a blame game. Uh, you may want to have rules like you shouldn't interrupt uh, the person who is speaking. You can support some of this if you have an in-person retrospective. You can support some of this, for example, by having a, 
a token that you have to pass around to be allowed to speak. That's a tangible reminder for people not to interrupt each other. You may repeat all these rules, but you also have to check in on, uh, on how people feel about it. It's surprisingly effective to simply ask everyone whether they feel safe to share. You get exactly uh, three answers. Well, not three answers, but you get uh, a couple of answers. Uh, the best one, of course, is the honest. Uh, I feel good. I feel relaxed. I'm willing to share. Answer. That's what you're hoping for. Uh, then you get people who are not so sure. Mm -hmm. And so obviously there are issues. So I'll talk about that in a second. And then, of course, you have the cynics who, who will say, yeah, whatever. Sure, I'm safe. But of course, obviously, I feel safe. But obviously, they don't. So the third one, are obviously, the hardest one to bring on board for a frank, open and safe for everyone discussion of issues uh, that hinder high performance. Um, you can, uh, people sometimes are even reluctant to simply say that they don't really feel safe because of some other person or because of worries about penalties or because what they think they will have to say will create for the problems, etc. You can anonymously poll people whether they feel safe. You don't need to find out, you don't need to know who may not feel safe. Um, but you do want to know that some people may not feel safe. And also, it's not a guaranteed nor required uh, that everyone says now, honestly, says that they feel fine to dive in in detail. Um, it may be okay or it's not a, well it's okay or you simply have to eventually move on even if they say is a holdout who um, for whatever reason um, uh, knows they are not going to participate uh, much so um, if there are too many problems um, you may want to ask people to address them what are the safety issues or the, the worries about feeling safe and why people don't feel safe you can let them do it anonymously you can allow them to frame it or phrase it in a third person which sometimes makes it easier to to say these things and put them on a board with post-it notes and then have a facilitated discussion on how possibly these worries could be addressed. For a project uh, for, for release retrospectives now, so we are looking over back over a time horizon of six weeks or a quarter, um, we found the timeline quite helpful. And um, the uh, uh, timeline would be a diagram that people draw about how they felt uh, over these, this course, this period of time. So um, you can see it here. You have these time slots, which are the sprints, and people make notes, put down cards as to how they feel, how they felt, good or bad. You can see here um, how, there is, uh, how the colors uh, code the, the feeling of people. So you can see from left, right obviously right up to this release retrospective people were happy and then at the end right now there is um, strife for their problems so things are, are red there um, and that's a common common problem as uh, things get problems get uh, pushed out and not dealt with they keep piling up and then when you give people a better voice than the sprint retrospective, for example, the release retrospective, then it will all come out and you have to deal with it. So that's why you need uh, a good facilitator who will uh, walk or work with you, uh, walk through the timeline, ask questions, what does it mean, how to, how to deal with this, how to deal with it, and also uh, from the discussion make notes on possible resolutions. 
Here you can see fabulous uh, Linda Rising, an expert facilitator who worked with Norm Kurth uh, when she visited us in Erlangen to perform uh, some retrospectives in an Amos project. This uh, developing the timeline and mining the timeline proceeds as I just uh, just uh, uh, did. Again, it needs a good facilitator who can point to events, put down on cards, relate them, help people correlate them, help people find, point out, identify problems and causes, etc. And of course, the facilitator or someone takes notes on what bubbles up as the likely root causes of the problems to be then discussed in how can we solve these problems and then uh, committing to solving those problems. So this was the release retrospective. While there are many sprint retrospectives, there will be uh, release retrospectives as well, but much less since they are less frequent. In a project, there may be a couple for the intermediate project releases in a product. They may be tied to the regular product releases, but they keep going on. Now we have the final form of a retrospective, the project retrospective, where there really was a custom client-specific project with a defined end date. And so once more, the scope expanded in terms of time to review what happened, but also in terms of a change to the situation, because again, now, the participants of the retrospective are, are parting ways. Some of them may come back together for a new project, and they might be colleagues, but it's not a given. And uh, for example, in Amos, obviously there's no certainty that the student team will ever come back together like it did in Amos after Amos finished. So the project retrospective is that retrospective for the whole project. Um, it replaces usually the final product release uh, if there was one, assuming the project didn't get killed. And according to Norm Kurth, it probably should be two or three days, uh, not just one day, if this was a serious undertaking. And it should be usually off-site. So it's important that there's sufficient value attached to it by how people act. And that means, for example, that a business sponsor should be willing to pay for the offsite, renting a hotel room somewhere and putting people there overnight so that they can review the project and, uh, and how well it worked and how, including what went wrong and how to improve on that. So you can have a Scrum Master again, if it's really a commercial project, um, maybe an outside person is better. Uh, but again, it's also like in the release retrospective, it's the committed and involved uh, team members. The way we do it in Amos is that you perform your retrospective and you write it down in the form of a letter uh, for next year's students. I pointed you to the retrospectives of past years, past cohorts. I hope you read some. Uh, please put in the effort to write a nice letter to next year's student, uh, summarizing your learnings from such a project retrospective as well. So here you now we have the full-blown structure as uh, created and vision um, uh, led by Norm Kurth. Uh, the three part, uh, setting the stage, uh, the beginning, uh, the hard work of reflection and learning, the middle part, and the conclusions where you end the retrospective and resolve to putting your learnings into action. As I mentioned, there's a book which goes in detail through a lot of these practices that are all, all of these practices have been designed uh, to bring out from the memory, sometimes from the resisting memory of people, 
um, these bits and pieces of insights that will be turned into collaborative learning. Um, practices are listed here as bullet items. So uh, in the beginning, when you're trying to create safety, um, you uh, do that with dedicated practices. You also want to explain or given the circumstances, define what success means to this retrospective, etc. The, the main body of work in the middle part, uh, they're different, different practices like the artifacts contest or the timeline, which we already know, uh, to bring out memories, get people talking, devise and derive insights on how to improve. Um, in the real world, if there were real strains or issues uh, between people, maybe you can, uh, can split them up. So one is session one best practices, session without managers. Sometimes uh, you want to remove certain people from the room or put them in another room. At the end, um, at the end uh, you want to uh, not only write down, uh, but commit to the solutions that you hopefully found. And uh, there are a couple of practices for that as well. So here is uh, a photo from an artifacts contest we once did in, in Amos. I think this is also still with Linda rising. And uh, so we asked people to just bring, that's the idea of the best practice here, just bring artifacts that reminded them of something in the project or in the time frame we were looking at. So it's simple, yeah? nothing complicated. So someone brought their coffee mug because they thought they drank too much coffee. And same thing, one person always snacked on M&Ms, so they brought their M&Ms. And the whole point is not to eat more M&Ms, but the whole point is to have them get up, show their artifact, to everyone and get them talking and as they are talking the others may be asking question and that those may get answered and that stimulates the memory and that creates the bringing to the forefront underlying issues bringing out the insights that could help improve the process here is a, a whiteboard emotion seismograph where you unlike the timeline don't put down the actual content of what you were doing but rather how you felt about it so that is very much like the happiness index which we effectively derived from the emotions uh, seismograph uh, when you look at this you can see the different characteristics so the always happy uh, hebrew uh, rob who seems to be a rather binary person either happy most of the time and then unhappy and maybe more complicated people with a lots of ups and downs. Um, still, they put down here, so don't be holier than the Pope, but they did put down milestones associated with, uh, with uh, the, these time frames. And all of this can be really hard if, uh, if your organization does not support that openness. And even as a good facilitator tries and often is successful at creating safety in the beginning, if the underlying organization has just too many issues, uh, it may still be very hard. You can find out whether your organization is dysfunctional by, for example, comparing these different aspects. Uh, you look at the language, how honestly are people are, how honestly are people communicating? or how guarded is the language. Uh, honest communication is straightforward active voice. Guarded language is passive voice, avoiding actors and what have you. Uh, how openly do people share and trust each other or how much distrust and withholding of information is there? Do people e express their appreciation or do they show a lack of respect? Are you encouraged to improve or are you really being pressured uh, to produce and so forth and, and so forth. So it should be um, pretty straightforward and most people will have an intuition about it uh, to see whether your organization is functional or dysfunctional. 
with the consequence that if it's just too dysfunctional, maybe it's not the right one for you. So a scrum master or a facilitator um, can measure their own success to some extent in how well the retrospectives work out. Uh, is the entire team engaged? Are they issues focused rather than attacking people? Is the discussion really relevant uh, for everyone? Uh, are people going off on tangents all the time? And of course, the most important, if you will, are people looking for solutions that are actionable, that would re will resolve the issues and will prevent problems from recurring. So these are all things that a Scrum Master can take to heart as both goals and a measure of their own success in running a retrospective. With that, in this uh, session we looked at process improvement using retrospectives, where retrospectives are uh, meetings of uh, people with at least a facilitator and a core number of participants from the project, where these people uh, look back over a past time horizon, usually the one running up to just right now before the retrospective, to understand what happened, to reflect on it, to learn from it, and to find ways of improving what they are doing to become more effective, to have higher team performance uh, for the next iteration, because the next iteration almost always comes. It certainly comes in this when the, if, when the scope is a sprint, or certainly comes when the scope is a project or product release. And even if the project finished, and it's a project retrospective, which is the largest of them all, even then people may come back together or may take this learning into other projects where they prevent, might prevent the problems they just had in the past project from recurring in the new project. That's why an organization should always perform retrospectives even after a project is over and the specific project's process won't be improved any longer. People take the knowledge to new projects and those will be better off because of the learnings from the past projects. With that, thank you very much for your time and attention and uh, we will meet next week again.